Today we're going back to Johto with the second of the three starters with a Feraligator solo run in Pokemon Crystal. I did Typhlosion a little bit ago and it was very good and I alluded to the high hopes that I had when looking forward to this run and I'm kind of itching to dive in so let's do the shortest intro ever. If you like solo run content, likes and comments, they really go a long way in helping channels grow and if you are a returning subscriber like I am the monkey nudist, I really appreciate the support. The rules for the run are in the description as well as an unlisted video if you want to go into more detail about my setup so check that out if you want to know a little more but i do think we have another banger on our hands today so before we get in before we get settled in grab yourself a soda pop and let's see how this one goes Let's make some upfront observations about Feraligator and start with the stats. Like all starters, they're fairly balanced, and there's a slight bit more emphasis on attack, and there's really nothing wrong here. Now if I was to make maybe like a foreshadowing critique of the stats, I would say that this Pokemon would greatly benefit if maybe some things were reassigned or reworked and the special attack was in the 90 to 95 range, but we can work with 79, it's not going to be a problem. As for the level up learn set, it's pretty basic, lots of normal moves, there's a ton of things that we won't use or we just can't wait to get rid of, and like almost all Johto Pokemon, it's really the TM learn set that's going to be more interesting. And there's some nice things here, you get Headbutt, Ice Punch, a Stab Surf, you get all of those decently early. And then things like a return or earthquake, they can really take advantage of that attack stat. And if you are wondering about hidden power, our DVs are perfect today and hidden power will not be in use because this little alligator just has no use for the coverage and I personally love it when that's the case. The journey today starts with the first rival and let's start to talk about some of the things I learned. I'll go in depth more soon about Rage, but it was a really solid early game move and as someone who plays Gen 1 more, it's just an awful piece of garbage there, but in Gen 2 it got reworked and it really kind of shined, but let's kind of leave that there for now, we'll come back to it. As is tradition, I named the rival three exclamation points because I'm just so excited to share my runs with you guys and wait, we got breaking news. Guys, I did not forget to talk to Professor M today, so just forget the fact, never mind the fact that I had to write this down on a notepad so I didn't forget, but it's really, guys, it's the small victories, don't forget that. Moving ahead on the next route, I'm not going to be keeping things to the minimum path. I am going to be battling fan favorite Youngster Joey, and I know, guys, it's a huge risk because he has a top percentage Rattata, but somehow, through sheer will and determination, I do make it through this fight. Now after this, this is going to be a small thing that I really want to highlight, but I don't find a Bell Sprout before getting to Violet City, and I'm bringing this up because as someone who likes to improve, I do watch other Crystal runs, and I notice that sometimes people will just keep searching, basically just until they find one, and I do think that that's going to be an overall time loss because you can simply catch one after Violet City without wasting any time at all. But when we do arrive, I do heal Rage's PP, and we're going to be skipping Sprout Tower today. This is pretty much the main reason I don't mix in gold and silver since it's mandatory there. And I just think that overall, Crystal provides more flexibility with its routing. But we are heading immediately to the gym, and I want to talk about Rage a little more. But not in this first battle here because I just go straight scratch. But the real strength in Gen 2 Rage is battles that last a little longer, maybe have more than a couple of Pokemon. And let's try to go over that real quick. First off, you are not locked into Rage like you are in Gen 1. Second, as long as you are using Rage and you take some damage, you have a Rage counter that's going to build. It starts at 1, Rage is 20 base power. You get hit, you get a Rage counter, the base damage is multiplied by the Rage counter, so if it's 2, you now have 40 base damage. So in terms of our learn set, it only takes one hit to be equal to Scratch's damage, and in fights where you have like two or more Pokemon like this, you can easily get three, four, or five Rage counters. Now we'll see it more, and I'll hop it up more as this video goes on, but let's not gush about it all day, but that extra youngster from earlier means that I do hit level 10 after this fight, and after gulping down a little potion, we can take a look at Faulkner. There's really not much to say here. I mean, it's just a little PG, guys. What do you want me to do? But it does go for Tackle, and since we're using Rage, we just talked about it. I get two additional Rage counters before I take it out, and we can move on to the Pidgeotto. At this point, the damage of Rage is already high enough for a two-shot, but we do get one more Rage counter for the road, and we take this one out incredibly easy. Now, I think we're all on the same page with Rage. We know how it works, and I can highlight it when it's relevant, but let's keep the pace going. 
Moving ahead to Route 32, I just want to show how easy it is to find a bell sprout here. Now, sure, it's a higher level. It means that it's slightly harder to catch, but you are given five free Pokeballs, and I just don't think it's worth waiting around earlier, especially when it's so common to get here. As for Union Cave, having a water move does allow us the luxury of picking up some very quick optional battles here. Hiker Daniel, he'll probably never battle again after this beating he took. Down in Azalea Town, let's watch some footage of me battling some rocket grunts and let's talk about the route a little bit now maybe you wonder why i don't do like a rough first playthrough edit that then follow it by the optimizations sometimes i do but it's mainly just due to time constraints i have a busy real life schedule but in the commentary i do like to share snippets of what kind of brought me to certain decisions just to give you guys some insight now early on when practicing this one getting to the level 20 mark for bugsy was a must and then having enough extra experience to hit level 20 one after that for bot it probably made things the most consistent but like most of these fine-tuned runs I did cut out a lot of extra early stuff because it's just a little bit slow and I was able to make do without as we'll see coming up my practicing and my faith was put to the test when we flip over to Bugsy's gym because I get poisoned by this weedle and at this point of the game I was really ready just to get the, the run done and just get that usable footage and you can see that we're only eight minutes in and that meant that I really I didn't buy antidotes yet I haven't even bothered to save a single time because we're just getting started you want to be as fast as possible we're just getting started so this led to some complications and you're gonna see here I fought the Beedrill trainer I also fought the Paris trainer just to get some extra levels I'm getting a little low it looks bad but you do pick up a super potion when you're fighting the slow pokes from earlier I use it and we're actually gonna look at Bugsy and you remember earlier we talked about how I wanted to be level 20 and I cut some stuff out but now we're out of potions we're poisoned we're a little bit under leveled from what I think would be the most consistent way and without further ado let's see how it turned out looking at the second gym leader Level 18, I know there's only one way to make this risky play pay off, and as much as I've talked about Rage, I think you know where this is going to head. I know Poison's going to be ticking each turn, but the hopes is that the incredibly weak Kakuna and Metapod will use Tackle or Poison Sting, maybe give me a few Rage counters, and I'll have enough left in the tank to outpace the Scyther. The plan goes decent here, and I get hit three times total to build up that Rage counter, and at this point, being below half health is the only issue going into the Scyther. I outspeed, but it goes for a quick attack that means I do get an additional rage counter and I hit back for about 80% of its health at this point even if it went for another quick attack I still think we would survive but it doesn't and our higher speed lets us land the killing blow with one more rage and this one felt pretty good like I said I hadn't saved at all and I didn't want to leave the gym heal up and come back because the ultimate goal when I play these runs is to beat the game as fast as possible and sometimes it's just really fun when some unexpected thing like this happens and you have to push the Pokemon to its limits. It's honestly one of the most fun things about doing these runs. It's also worth noting that you can learn Fury Cutter from Bugsy, and honestly I really wanted this move to actually be useful, but I really couldn't figure out a place where it helped. And we'll use it to its fullest one day, but it's just not going to be in this run. I would also like to say that Gen 2 Rage mechanics, they're pretty hard to find like an exact explanation online. And I could be mistaken, but I did my research. I dove in the best that I could. And I think that Smogan was the best Gen 2 source I could find. But in the last fight, after that last quick attack from Scyther, the Rage counter was up to 5, meaning that it was around 100 base power. And overall, kind of understanding how Gen 2 Rage works and you utilizing it to its fullest allowed me to get through this early game by shaving off several optional things and I think I was really happy with this final result. Earlier I did mention that level 20 felt a little better and I kind of alluded to hitting level 21 after so you can learn bot and now I think it's time to bring the rival in to figure out why. And as you're gonna see here, Ghastly, it's really not an issue. Two water guns does do the job, now Bot would one-shot it, and that means there is the chance for hypnosis here, and it could slow down your time at best, and I guess the worst case scenario would be a potential reset. And at the end of the day, when you're making these cuts, you're trying to trim down the run, I just didn't see Ghastly as this major level threat to warrant grinding an additional early game level, and I just went with this approach at the end. Next up is Bayleaf, and and Pokemon weak to grass in the early game, they generally have a significantly harder time. And that's just because it gets an early Razor Leaf, and we're going to see that here. Now luckily, it's not a guaranteed crit like it would be in Gen 1 because it depends on the speed stat. And the fact that the AI 
I would really like to put a status condition on us first. All that combines together to give me enough time to start building up that rage counter for this one. When it's all said and done, Bayleaf doesn't crit, and I'm left with about half health. I got a few rage counters. The Zubat at the end doesn't stand a chance, and that's the rival down. Now I need to insert this part into the video. Sometimes guys, life, it happens. Maybe I need to leave the room. Maybe I need to pause the playthrough for whatever reason. And 99% of the time, everything works great. But for whatever reason here, the timer, it just kept going. I have some screenshots to precisely measure the lost time, but you can see here that we're at 10 minutes and four seconds when I ended the rival fight. And here in this next screenshot, it's gonna be 13 minutes and 13 seconds. I'm doing screenshots because I really wanna be accurate and adjust the final time, and if you're keeping score if you need the quick math it's uh three minutes and nine seconds and i'm gonna be adjusting that i think it's pretty significant because when you look at my best runs gramble typhlosion those two are only separated by just a mere minute and this is going to be kind of a side tangent this is why i'm not in love with real life time because human error and mistakes it can absolutely derail a run and basically the only reason that i'm not forced just to redo this run is because i just i simply didn't notice that the timer was still going until post-production and i don't think there's going to be any argument that can be made for why I shouldn't adjust this time. It's three minutes and nine seconds of just dead air and it would punish for Ralligator because I personally had to take a call, answer the door, whatever the case may be and I didn't want to have that happen and I just want to be transparent and I want to document it for you guys. And if this video was a book, the overarching theme of the previous chapters would be rage and how it exceeded my expectations in every way and as much hype and gratitude as I have given this move so far, it's time to shine is essentially over. Rage has improved a lot in Gen 2, and I think I've I think I've done a pretty great job at showcasing that. But at the end of the day, it is 20 base power, and with Headbutt coming up here, that 70 base power, it just kind of falls off the cliff in terms of its usefulness. You would need to use Rage. You would need to get hit three times and build up three Rage counters to start outpacing Headbutt's damage. And with Johto's leveling curve and the fact that we're pretty much already going to start out leveling everything in the entire game from this point on, maybe outside of some extremely rare exceptions. It just puts this move in the trash can. But now we can go to Golden Raw. We can do some busy work as usual. I battle some level 10 slow pokes. I get for Alligator's haircut. I pick up Abra for that juicy teleport. And I also pick up the bike. Then I run into our main man, Juggler Erwin. He's holding it down with his level two Voltorb. And then I listen to Flora talk about squirting some water on a tree. And from there, it's time for a quick Golden Rod Mart visit. And we can go ahead, we can pick up Return. It's not useful right now, but it's good to get. And I'm also a little bit short on cash to be able to afford Ice Punch. So I meander about a little bit. I have to sell some TMs. Minor time loss doesn't really matter. And I will say that Ice Punch is really good, but Typhlosion getting two punches here in the early game was a little better. And and considering for alligator's special attack isn't its strong suit, it's just not as helpful as it was in that run, but it is gonna be a welcome addition nonetheless. Now we can take a look at Whitney, and this is just kind of like a headbutt show. Things aren't too interesting here. We take out the Clefairy quickly, but I do get this magical double flinch on the mill tank, and that's pretty cool. It made an easy battle even easier, and that's the third badge down. And considering that our attack stat is the strength of this Pokemon, and how good headbutt is, and eventually return's gonna be, that 12.5% increased damage to normal moves from this badge will be very helpful, but I guess it's always helpful considering how powerful those moves are and how widely and commonly used they are. Now let's pick back up an Ecritique, and this is where Feraligator kind of evens the scales with Typhlosion. Those extra punches for our fiery boy, it gave it a very strong mid game, but right here, access to a super powerful 127 effective power surf with Stab, it's just gonna be extremely strong and it's gonna stick with us throughout the rest of the game. Next up is something that I've kind of curated from my crystal runs and I've started to refine over the last few videos. Basically, there's just no reason to worry about fighting the Burnt Tower rival or Morty at the moment if there's either one a chance that there's going to be a reset here or if maybe Chuck's going to be an issue. If either of those things are true, just go ahead and do what I'm doing here. The smarter play is going to be go ahead and head towards Olivine. You can do things like I'm going to do here. I'm going to pick up the Mint Berry. I'm going to go ahead and shop for the run Super Repels, pick up Strength, catch a Krabby, and then I can get the experience from the Lighthouse. There's essentially zero time loss here because you can just teleport back 
an overall grinding mandatory experience a little bit earlier rather than going off and doing side content just makes this a very very minimal time loss it feels very efficient in the case of for alligator the rival really wasn't that big of an issue but morty did have potential and if you are going to get the mint berry anyway just do that extra stuff that we just talked about as for the rival it's it's fairly trivial i do have bite for the haunter i have a neutral surf for magnemite even though i accidentally used bite on accident and even the previously worrisome Bayleaf is just taken care of in a couple of ice punches. And with that Zubat just trying to hide in the back, bless its little heart, this one's a done deal. We won't be seeing the rival anymore in this video because it's just going to waste everyone's time, let's be real. And before the gym leader battle, I do equip the previously mentioned Mint Berry, and now I think we can take a look at Morty. Ghastly is first, and we can just go ahead and say that it and the Haunter, they're both one-shots. Bot is good, but its weaker base power means that a stabbed Surf is actually better here. And while this battle, it's not going to seem bad, remember that we did hold off. Gen 2 runs in general are a little bit out of my comfort zone, and I mainly play Gen 1. So here, I really strive for consistency, and that's why I really like the Mint Berry here. And I guess what this comes down to is that I want to show you how a potentially tricky battle, it just becomes very consistent if you do some things out of order but here we do get to save our mint berry for later if we need it and that's really about all there is to say for this one next up is also something that you've noticed in previous videos the same for this goes like i said earlier unless you have a near perfect pokemon that can just go ahead do the rival do morty then just go straight to chuck all in one go without doing anything extra then by all means do that but for me, it always feels better to go ahead and handle the Lake of Rage and maybe the Rocket Hideout in some situations. And this run right here is a rare case because I don't need hidden power. But you can still do things like talk to Lance. You can, there's a rare candy. There's an elixir. Both of those things are really nice to have. And I'm doing all of this because I want to take on the Rocket Hideout before I swim down south. The Ralligator doesn't have the best matchup against Chuck. It's not bad. We'll talk about that later. And just like going down to Olivine earlier before Morty, it's kind of one of those things where you can go ahead and take care of something that you would be doing anyway and this little extra experience here would just kind of benefit you more in the short term if you think about it outside of the leveling curve the biggest gen 2 complaint i hear and something i personally think myself is that these two rocket segments they're an absolute slog and it feels like you're just trying to go through the motions and get it over with so you can get back to actually having fun with the game and when you're doing it in this order it at least makes sure you're getting something out of it and honestly it's still a pretty slow section and it does kind of make me wonder what pokemon if any is ever going to need to actually show battles here i'm pretty sure even pokemon like tyrogue and and Pichu would just breeze through this section and it's kind of a little sad if you think about it poor rockets poor grunts just like with the alternate path earlier a quick teleport with Abra if you avoided the Poke Center just makes the time loss so minimal and I would like to say a very kind viewer made me aware that in gen 2 if you just walk into the Poke Center at all it will set up the teleport warp to that location so if you're doing like this you're doing mahogany skip you're warping back to Ecritique then don't go near the Poke Center please now that we've essentially taken care of everything that we can it's time for a brisk swim down to Cinnabar and the reason we went this route it was because of that mint berry for Morty earlier that consistency is good the second half of that it was for Chuck I briefly touched on it let's go into more detail and I wouldn't say this is a tough matchup it's not a bad matchup it's just when you got things like hypnosis and dynamic punch and you don't have great ranges it means that there's this margin for error there's a possibility to waste time or have resets even and you guys you already know sometimes the computer it decides that hey I want to win I'm gonna win I'll do whatever it takes and with Chuck the AI often decides that hey dynamic punch now has a 100% accuracy too bad reset I'm winning and the last thing is that around this time and this goes doubly for this run because we did the extra training it's that return is now going to be way far ahead of headbutt so if you have that there's no reason not to use it here I think that's enough preamble it's time to take a look at Chuck, brother. And this one's not going to get an intro this week. Primate is one return and done. But notice, I do still have that mint berry from earlier. It's because there is a solid chance that Polyrath will just go for hypnosis. And this is just added insurance for that. Considering we can guarantee a two shot and we outspeed, it's essentially the battle over. Like I talked about earlier, you guys always watch my best run. Now, I really do. In the bottom of my heart, I wish I had 20 hours to dedicate to each video where I can just do like seven playthroughs, take my time 
I can show you guys the complete full blind playthrough and then I wish I had the audience that would actually stick around to the end for all the optimizations but the best that I can do for that balance is to tell you guys the pitfalls and the overall changes I had to make and Chuck was kind of one of those things. In early iterations of this fight I did not outspeed Primate and I was also stuck with Headbutt because Return just wasn't that powerful yet and you were also in like a three shot range for the Polyrath and all of that kind of added up to some resets and some inconsistency. Like I I could beat it if I kept throwing myself at the brick wall, but I really do like my consistency here, and you kind of seen the final results, and I think we can move on. With Fly, we do have some more errands to do before we pick back up the pace, and today we are getting the Mystic Water for the first time. We don't have spectacular special attack, and this really does help give Surf that little extra bit of edge. It's pretty helpful. And I don't have to go into detail with everything here. There's some items we need to get. There's two rare candies. Now there's gonna be a PP up that's gonna help you avoid healing during the rocket segment very important and there's a nugget just for some extra money near golden run now let's get back to it first up is jasmine and there's going to be a lot of pokemon we're going to see in the future that struggle with steel types and they're just going to need extra levels maybe even uh, dedicate their hidden power just to beat this fight and for this pokemon specifically all you guys need to know is that jasmine she's desperate to hide that steelix in the back and I think that's all we need to know. We can end the battle on that. Now we're going to Price, and we can keep this one really brief as well. I have High Attack, and I have Return for his first two Pokemon, so we can kind of quickly cliff note the Seal and the Dugong, and that Pile of Swine is weak to water, and just like that, seven badges are down, and I think you guys know what that means. It's time for the dreaded phone call that there's even more rocket battles to do, and as a content creator, I'm really thankful for the magic of video editing to cut out these 23 battles against Zubats and Coughings, but needless to say it's really easy and I'd like to stress that the PP up earlier using it on return it really helps you to avoid healing and just like with Nugget Bridge in Gen 1 this is the highest cluster of mandatory battles in the entire game so anything you can do to speed this up it'll go a long way in your runs and you can see here we wrap it all up around six minutes which honestly is not that bad and now for my favorite part of the video I get to pick up the pink bow from Mary and we get to see Feraligator with a pink bow and I hope you appreciate it as much as I do it's looking very dapper to Today. Next up is the vitamin buy for the run. Here I'm going to get 5 proteins, 4 calciums. Now it's worth noting that my crystal runs are a little bit different than others. If you've been watching the other ones you already know. I personally, I loathe and I despise curse and rest red battles. So my decisions for my run, they're kind of based around cutting the competitive time off of the end of the blue fight specifically. And then after that we'll show a consistent red fight without the timer. And if you're wondering why, just go watch the Steelix video. And you guys can just tell me how bad that that run would be and how punished that Pokemon would be if red was part of the timer, but I digress. You can do your runs how you want, I can do mine how I want. I bring this up just because Feraligator is a really good Pokemon and we can actually take out red with very few tweaks and one of those would be cutting out these calciums. We could save enough post game Elite Four money to get Ice Beam immediately. I opted to go with the calciums now for that short term solution, but Ice Beam is a great move. It would ever so slightly speed up our Kanto time, but kind of stay tuned until after after the blue fight. For a strat, I think no one else uses for tutor moves like Ice Beam. It's pretty unique. We're always experimenting with new strategies. Now the last thing before Claire is that I do pick up Never Melt Ice inside of the aptly named Ice Cave. And now we can just kind of dive into that. And there's going to be no need for theatrics for this one today. This one is straight return. Oftentimes you hear about hidden power ice, but with great attack, I just I spam return guys. That's all there is to it. No need for ice punch today. And I even tank a critical hit hyper beam. I kind of shrug it off real easy and we collect that badge. Now we can start to take a look at the Elite Four. And I'm going to go on a bit of a tangent here. Um, the state of Gen 2 solo runs, I guess I want to talk about. I do share my strategies. I share my insight with you guys. And like I said earlier, I do watch other runs. And I just want to declare that there needs to be a Gen 2 race at some point. It's kind of like the Wild West out here. Everyone has their own rules. Everybody has their own strategies. And sometimes it can be hard to tell if someone's actually good at the game or not. And I guess by extension, let me say that you can actually be really, really knowledgeable at the game, but not have that not translate into like a tangible route that yields high tier results, if you know what I mean. At this stage in time, everyone, like I said, is doing their own thing. They're racing themselves. And I would love to have the opportunity to see where my true skill level lies. At this stage, we're seeing a bunch of strategies that just aren't proven, and I just think it would be a fun experience. Now, the only drawback to me personally, kind of like with the Parasec race that I hope to God's out by now, if it's not, it's gonna be weird, is that you have to use somebody else's rules rather than your own that you've been using for like years. But I'm fine with that as long as we're not doing something antithetical to racing like pausing the game to catch 
Gym Pokemon. I just, I wouldn't mind outside of that. But I do have to say that I never in my entire life want to do a five week long race again. Maybe something a little bit quicker. I'd be interested in that. I'd enjoy it. That's all I wanted to say. Now we are seeing how trivial the rival battle is. This is the last rival battle in the game. We never show it. This is why. It's kind of like a little bonus treat for you. You may have noticed that I do pick up Earthquake. And I have to say that this learn set's looking pretty nasty. But now my friends, I think it's time we take a look at the Elite Four. For Will, I am going to be using Nevermelt Ice, and you can see it over there on Feraligator's head like a crown. This one is very easy, but this held item does help me hit little ranges on things like the Executor. But while we do have this free battle going on, I want to remind you guys that my routing and my decisions, they're based on getting the fastest blue split. I don't want to be focused on over leveling for red or kind of rolling my face across the controller as I use brain dead curse strategies. But let's go into why I said that. It's because I'm going to be using five rare candies here before Koga, and if you were desperately hoarding onto your resources for red then this would not be possible but it does make a lot of sense here to speed up the rest of the elite four and it helps me hit a lot of ranges and this one it wasn't bad without the rare candies but as for the first two pokemon they're quick one shots and the first pokemon i wanted some candies for was fortress this thing is so absurdly tanky if you don't have fire moves but at level 55 with a couple of proteins popped in earthquake can two shot it and maybe one of these days guys i'll be brave enough to do a fortress solo run but i wouldn't hold your breath on that now muck goes down in a single quake and Crobat, it's another potentially annoying Pokemon. I still can't one-shot it, so that kind of opens up some potential double team and toxic shenanigans, but I do comfortably outpace it, and we take the battle. Now let's drop the difficulty back down with Bruno. He's much like Gen 1 Bruno today. Sometimes he's tough in Crystal. And the only thing to say here is I do flub my moves a little bit on Hitmontop. I waste some turns, but it's pretty clean outside of tanking a cross-chop crit, but it's pretty straightforward. We can just kind of move ahead to Karen. First up is Umbreon, and we let her return loose, and we will not be in the Umbreon one-shot club today like Gramble was. And for my troubles, I do take a sand attack into a Confuse Ray, and that's just really cool. What can you really say about it? I do hurt myself a little, and it really extends this battle, but eventually I do take it out. I'm a little bit worried at this point, but the great news is that Confuse has already worn off. I do have the Never Melt Ice on again, and for this fight, it's mainly for the Bile Plume. It goes just like you drew it up. I move first, hit with the Ice Punch, and that means we don't have to worry about any status moves today. From there, Gengar is next. I don't miss this and from this point the battle is essentially over. I've said this before but Gen 2 sand attacks does put you at 75% accuracy whereas in Gen 1 it only puts you at 66. It just means that you have a much higher chance to hit and it's just not even close to as oppressive as it can be there but in this fight much like Agatha there's always that chance to kind of slow you down and waste your time but this one it really wasn't that bad of a result all things considered. Now there's one battle left and before we dive in let me say guys sometimes I make mistakes. Sometimes it's really hard for me to watch these back but let's kind of dive into the champion fight to see what I'm talking about. This battle is extremely easy. I even put on the pink bow just to kind of sure up some ranges and the double weak to ice dragons are handled with ice punch. We outspeed the Aerodactyl as well. So why am I foreshadowing a loss here? What happened? Now get a load of these series of events here. Now first off, I fat finger return. I use the wrong move. Then he uses thunder wave. I get paralyzed. Now that alone is not enough to lose the game, but can I interest anybody out there, any of you guys in a thunder hit, not even just a hit, a crit into a full paralysis to miss my turn. My friends, this is what this dirty, filthy rat AI is capable of, and I'm sick of it. But I guess, hey, I guess it happens sometimes, right? Because it just did. Now, I do fight back. I actually take out the first Dragonite, but it's not enough. I take a Hyper Beam. It puts me in the dirt. I'm six feet under. I'm rethinking all of my life decisions, and it's, it's, it's a very unfortunate first reset of the run. Needless to say, I wasn't too happy about the result. It was an absolutely karmic level of bad luck. It was awful. Think about it once again. The odds of me accidentally picking the wrong move, getting paralyzed, then thunder with its 70% accuracy. Oh, it hitting's hard. Not only that, it crits, and then you miss your next turn with paralysis. I would say it's pretty low. I would have a better chance at just going on the basketball court. No warm-up. Haven't shot a basketball in a decade and hitting a half-court shot. I have a better chance of that than all this happening right here. Now, I'm not going to fume over it. Let's just let's cool our head. Let's move on. Now, you've seen the next attempt. It's going on in the background right now, 
And yeah, it's a pretty trivial battle, so even though I almost lost my cool, it's kind of like the Parasect race, which once again, I hope it's out because I, I hate referencing something that's been delayed a hundred times. Maybe it's out, I hope so. But you can't let a little bitty misstep define your run and you gotta keep your composure. And I think it's one of the keys in real-time situations, but that's it for Johto. I banished the champion back to the Shadow Realm and that's it. For Alligator has conquered Johto, but we still have a little bit left to go. If you remember earlier our adjusted time, it means that when we end the champion battle, we're at sub 55 minutes which is incredibly promising now, anytime you're at sub hour period in the johto segment it's great and like i said earlier we do have a banger on our hands but let's not delay anymore let's fade to black and let's come back to the second for alligator story arc To start us off here, notice how I'm not going for anything extra. Those extra vitamins earlier means that, like I said, we can't afford Ice Beam. And even though it's not overly helpful, it would make the blue fight a little better. We'll talk about that later. But we board the ship, now let's get down to business. And like always, there's not much to talk about with Kanto. If you need a visual reminder of how easy this part of the game is, just know this. We're a water type. We're going to the electric type gym leader, Lieutenant Surge, first. Not only first, but fearlessly without even saving the game because I know I can never lose this battle. And I think that kind of sums up the vast majority of the Gen 2 Kanto segment. Very easy. Outside of that, like I said earlier, it's just a wild west out here experimenting in terms of Gen 2 routing, so I'm always trying to do some stuff. And there was a style I was testing out where you would go straight to Sabrina, and then when you warp out of there, you head straight down to Lavender Town for no other reason than just to go ahead and pick up the flight pad so you can use it later for the Machine Park quest. I do think that this has some promise, but there's this one little idiot here with three low-level Magnemites that can't let me pass. He's really annoying, but like I said, we're always testing. The last thing that I'm going to mention here is that I learned something watching my boy Hidden Jim talking to him afterwards. I've been grinding Crystal for several months and I never knew that you could just straight up, you could skip this machine part rocket grunt. It's not a mandatory battle and I guess I just never paid attention. And to be fair, I guess most people don't put this in their videos, but it is always good to learn something new. I love it. I guess when you're on times four speed, it's like maybe a 10 second, maybe 15 if you're being generous. But keep this in mind, guys. If I keep learning 10 second saves, 15 second saves here and there, it's going to add up. I'm going to get better and better, but that's enough of that. I think we could just go take a look at blue. Up first is Pidgeot, and we're about to see the two sole reasons why Ice Beam would make Kanto a little faster. This bird can survive an Ice Punch, it gets a move off, and I have to spend a second turn, and when we get to the Executor, the same thing applies there. I'm gonna ask you guys a question now, I beg I beg the question of you. If you think that cutting four vitamins, flying back to Goldenrod, talking to the Move Tutor, learning Ice Beam, if you think that's actually faster than just going to Kanto immediately, and ultimately the only cost it has is letting Blue take two extra turns. Something tells me that this is the faster way, but I'm always down to hear you guys' thoughts. At this point, the only things left are weak to water or they're frail like Alakazam, and the only thing that can even survive a move is Gyarados, but overall it really can't do much to us, and this one wasn't that bad, it's pretty much over, and that's the 16th and final badge down. As for our recorded blue split here, for Alligator has a time of 1 hour, 10 minutes, and 56 seconds, and once again, I'm going to remind you guys about adjusting the time. It just wasn't paused earlier, so once again, that was 3 minutes and 9 seconds of just dead air, and that's going to put Feraligator at a time of 1 hour, 7 minutes, and 47 seconds, which puts it ahead of anything I've done so far. It's ahead of the pack. It's great, but you guys know, Generation 2, it's not just about the blue split. I think everybody here wants to see the red fight, so let me show you my setup before we get into that. And first up, let me say that the Poke Center for Mount Silver, it's a flyable path, and the main thing here is it's in Johto. Experimenting has shown me that this is the absolute fastest way to backtrack during the post game and we're gonna do it here overall for the entire game this is the one battle that I can emphatically say that ice beam is a must and like I just said I think using the Mount Silver flight path to go here is the fastest way to do it in a solo challenge but maybe we can actually prove that one day outside of that I approach red as if the time actually matters and to make things just a little bit easier I do backtrack a little bit I'm gonna head up to the seafoam islands I'm gonna get the rare candy there it's hidden and I really struggle to hit that spot here it's kind of embarrassing to be honest but it is what it is and then then I go backtrack even further, we go into Mount Mortar, we get the rare candy in there as well. I also announced this in the Typhlosion video, it's really, it doesn't matter, but I 
remove the darkness from caves. I think anybody, if anybody's listening and they record crystal runs, at this point, I'm I'm personally like 100 runs deep. I know every map, like the back of my hand, it can be dark, light, snowing, raining, I don't care. I could navigate these caves with my eyes closed, so all it does to keep them dark is make your video look worse. So we can see in here, that's pretty cool, right? I'm gonna use all of my rare candies, and since we did use a lot earlier, I'm only gonna be at level 72, but I think we can just kind of see what this fight looks like now and see if we need to do anything else to make this one actually consistent. Pikachu is first, we outspeed, and this is never going to be an issue. We don't ever have to show this little rat again. Next, he brings out the Venusaur, and this is where Ice Beam is going to shine. I do move first, I do half damage, and this is kind of checkmate for this battle. At this point, it's either going to use Solar Beam, charge it up, or it's going to set up Sunny Day. Either way, no damage. I'm going to knock it out in the next turn, and you would think at this point that's going to be the hardest Pokemon down already. Espeon is third. I don't really want to see a Reflect here, but it just goes straight Psychic, and it does a massive amount amount of damage to me over the course of a couple of turns and by the time I do take it out I'm only at 58 HP and since I don't have any way to heal this one's not looking too great. Snorlax is up and I could just go for the throat here. For alligator gives it his all with a critical hit return but this big beefy Snorlax does hang on and on the next turn a body slam forces the first reset of this fight. I jump in at the same level because honestly it wasn't that awful of an attempt and I just want to see if the results repeat themselves or if I need to do something different. As far as Venusaur goes it's about the same but the Espeon kind of proved to be the problematic Pokemon. I go for return, I move first, I hit hard. Now one Psychic's not too bad, but the crucial thing here is that we speed tie. Now you could use some Carbos earlier, but let's not get into that now. But it wins the speed tie, essentially getting off back-to-back -back Psychics, and by the time it's done, I'm in pretty much the same exact position as last time. And try as I might, try my hardest, I'm not going to win this one at level 72 with this setup, and I don't think I'm going to win without any like great amount of luck. So let's go back to the drawing board and hit back into it. It. it felt really close, so I just go up to level 73 this time. We want that sweet damage rounding threshold. And rather than using the pink bow, I am going with the tried and true leftovers. Maybe we can stem some of the bleeding going into the Snorlax. At the start of the battle, things play out pretty much exactly the same. Eventually, we're back to the Espeon, and now we outspeed, and that's pretty much the real difference maker here. I move first. I decimate it with a return, but it does hang on. It sets up a reflect as a parting gift, but I am at full health heading into the second leg of the race. Snorlax is next, and I know I need to outlast the Reflect, but a turn 1 Amnesia does essentially mean that I'm just going to spam return. No point in going for Ice Beam trying to bait out the freeze chances. Now this one's very, very slow. I can't quite knock it out at one point, so it uses rest. We have to repeat the process. It takes forever. And at the end of the day, I am tanking the moves pretty great. Leftovers is keeping the damage to a minimum, and eventually I do take the Lax down. I'm still in green health at this point. Blastoise is next, and I don't think there's really much it can do to threaten me. It actually has to go for resisted serves. They're not really doing much, but when you do a lot of them, they are starting to add up a little bit, but eventually with return, I do outpace it. And now Red has no choice but to send out that Charizard. He's been trying to hide it in the back. I've been licking my chops this whole time, and I promise I just want to talk. And by talk, I mean let's drown this lizard and ultimately end the run. And that's the Red Fight down. And just like I've been doing with my other runs, I have made a tier list. We're going to show it this week. Now remember, Crystal is something kind of newer to me, so some of these already need to be redone. It's kind of sad. And if you're still confused about the rules, then I don't know, dude. Read the description. I don't know what to tell you. The TLDR of all of it is that watch the Steelix video. If you want to know why I would rather have the blue split timed and then just see how to do a consistent red, I hate curse. All you need to know. Now as for our tier list, you can see that I am listing the level they completed red at. And in the case of Buff, you'll see that curse is just written down there because it had to resort to that forbidden fruit because it was really bad. At this moment, I wouldn't take too much stock in the crystal tier list, but it is fun to see, I guess. I'm still improving, but overall for Alligator was fantastic. It just handled every situation well, and I think if you're even if you're playing a rule set where you're stopping your timer at red, a very few slight adjustments could be made to make this an easy like one hour and 15 minute run, but I just think it's more fun to see what a consistent red fight looks like. I don't know about you guys. I don't like seeing curse. I don't like seeing all this kind of overlay 
leveling and stuff. And if you think about it, these rules are going to benefit bad Pokemon more, so it'll kind of make more sense later if you're sitting there passing out because you just can't comprehend English. But I think that's all I have for you guys. Special shout out to my channel members. I do appreciate the support. And I think we should have a couple of more Alolan runs coming up. I plan on maybe doing one more Gen 2 run before I take a break. I don't know why I even bring that up because by the time this video comes out, the break will already be over. But I digress. That's the end for me. If you're still listening to my voice, you're a real one. Comment that below. I really like to see who's makes it this far. Not many of you do, but I, I'm out. That's it for me. Bye.